when did you know you were an artist? Mm. My father told me I was an artist. <laughs> I was in kindergarten. I came home with a crayon drawing, and he says, you're an artist. And I thought, that sounds great. I like that. <laughs> I, I, that sounds elevated. It sounds like, oh, like I'm a queen or something. Where did you get trained? How, where was your well, training Well, you know, I... Um, I went to Roosevelt High here in the community, and then I ended up going to San Fernando Valley State College, which became CSUN. Mm -hmm. And I went there for a couple of years, and then I came out. And I was having difficulty because I, they weren't allowing me to major in the things I wanted to major in. I wanted to be an artist. And they said, well, if you change your major, will cut your funding off. And I said, oh, well, if you're gonna do that, why am I here? <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm in debt, I'm gonna, you know, I, I just felt like, okay, if I'm gonna to go to school, it's gonna be for something I want. And I really didn't, at the time, wanna be a teacher. I have to say that these programs that I ended up working into and out of were programs that gave me and taught me a lot of patience, gentleness, compassion in a way that I, I didn't have. I worked in the prison for a while. I worked with gangs. I worked with the deaf. You know, I've worked with a lot of different populations, high risk. And I have to say that I think the most important thing out of the whole experience is the fact that I learned something about myself. I can be harsh, and I learned how not to be harsh, how to be gentle with, you know, you get some constituent who has tattoos, and they're tough, and they're bad, and they're this and they're that, and you realize how fragile they are. Yeah. And, and you learn how to cope with that, and you learn to understand things in a different way. Yeah. That's why I like doing portraits, because it takes it, you know, like people say, Chicano art is this, Mexican art is this, white art is this, this is that. But when you sit down and you have an exchange with someone, and it's a true exchange, something from the heart, something from the mind, something that gives you an insight into them, but also an insight into yourself because you realize you don't deal that way. It, it gives you an understanding of another human being. And instead of just talking about people as this culture, this person, this stereotype, this icon, this cliche, you're dealing with a human being. You know, whatever you are, I get to enjoy a part of that and understand who, you're, who you are without all the defense mechanisms up. Mm -hmm. The conversation changes. Mm -hmm. That's what makes it valuable. Mm -hmm. In 83, I got a job at the LA Photo Center and I learned photography What's um, the LA, what was the LA Photo Center? The Los Angeles Photography Center is one of the art centers uh, that was run by the city of Los Angeles. Mm. And Glenna Avila, who had formerly been uh, director of the mural program, Citywide Murals, I had done a mural with her. So she hired me to work at the photo center and I took the Day of the Dead, which was being celebrated at Self Help Graphics, and I moved it to the west side of town. And I invited people uh, besides Chicanos and Mexicanos, I invited people of the community to participate because the one thing we all have in common is that we all die. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nobody gets out of here alive. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that being said, I said, well, you know, and so I had artists who were Chinese, artists who were African-American, Cuban, um, Japanese, white, 
participate in this event. Yeah. And that's when it really took off from the other side because people felt that they had the freedom to participate and that you didn't have to be just Chicano, that yeah. it could be celebrated everywhere. Yeah. Because everybody dies. Yeah. Well, um, I worked in Chicago for three years and I worked for a woman named Diane Wheat and uh, she collected African art and we repaired a lot of, a lot of work stuff from China, stuff from all over the place. And she said to me, look, if you go around the world in tropical areas, you're going to find um, bright, vivid colors because there's bright, vivid butterflies and flowers and the temperature is different and the climate is different and the color is different. So, you know, if you go to a place like Indonesia, you're going to find that the colors are very bright and vivid. And, uh, you know, Mexico, Latin America, places like that, the colors are very strong. And so, like, when she talked about color and she talked about mixing color and stuff like that, and I came to realize, you know, like Gauguin, everybody talks about this Frenchman Gauguin who was a colorist and whatever. Well, he, his mother was from Peru, and he grew up in Peru for the first 10 years of his life. Gauguin was a colorist, you know, and he was a colorist because it came from his culture from Peru, from the Americas. Uh-huh, uh-huh. That's where it came from. It didn't come from France. His sense of color and the way it was used was very much from here in Latin America. I learned something from her about that and her her absolute respect for the African art and arts that are oftentimes considered primitive mm -hmm. you know um, they're not that primitive <laughs> they're no. very sophisticated so I was watching the History Channel and they had this little stamp that the International Workers Union put out to raise money for the um, I think they were called the Greensboro Seven, seven African American men who were accused of raping a white woman on a train. There was a defense fund for them. And um, what happened is um, they raised the money by selling these little stamps. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, that's cool. We need our own stamp as artists. We, uh -huh. need to make, we need to raise our own money. We're always being asked to donate our work. And yeah. It's always, we're used as fundraisers, but no one's reciprocating. We need to do this for ourselves. Yeah. So within three months, I put together 12, 13 runs, eight people on a sheet of paper, and we printed our own stamp. The idea being that you print your own money your own currency. So I call it creating cultural currency. You got to figure out how to pay the rent one way or another. Well, you know, it's, it's interesting listening to you talk about these things because I feel like so much of what you're saying to me anyway, so many of your initiatives are about changing the dynamic between the funder and the recipient or the creator and the consumer and turning it into a bunch of people working together with everybody moving forward to get communal, to achieve communal win-win situations, right? That's what I heard about the toys, that's what I heard about the stamps. And it's, it's most people just don't think that way, right? Right. Because it's, it's a different paradigm, really. Well, you know, I, I that's the kind of mentoring I do, you know. Um, I want, you know, I want, you know, the, the art world can be a very fickle place. I've said this before, and uh, I'll say it again, you know, it can be a very fickle pa place. A lot of women have a hard time getting acknowledged. Uh, I don't take it for granted. 
at all. This show is very important for me. It's sort of a milestone. You know, I'm 70. And I want to feel like what I've left and what I've done has value to my community. And also, if I can do it, it means that people after me will feel like they too can do it. So that's, for me, an important milestone. We have to have that within our community. You know, sometimes my portraits aren't all about likeness. It has more to do with feeling, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. than, than whether or not it looks like the person, but whether or not it feels like the person, you know, because it's more like a record of the moment that you had together. Mm -hmm. The most important thing that skill that you can have as an artist is to be in the moment, to be present. Yeah. And people are not accustomed to that. You know, we play little tapes in the back of our heads. Yes. Judgments. And what I learned is judgments that we carry about other people are the same judgments that we carry about ourselves. Absolutely. And if you can let go of them, you unencumber that relationship and speak more directly and you live without so many judgments and guilt and all the other crap that we carry in our, in our relationships. So the best and most important thing that you can be and do when you are painting is to be right here, not thinking about where you were, what you're going to do, what you did, what somebody said, what somebody thinks of you. It's about letting go of all of that and staying in the moment and here and now, and I can, that way I can see you better. I'm not seeing him or something that he said right. or something somebody said. And if you are really there channeling your skill and the conversation, you open the door to being maybe in a state of grace where what you do and what you think and what you know and all that stuff, whether you put it forth or not, it flows out into the work. So you mentioned your posse. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by your posse? My posse, you know, I, 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 people always say I have classes and I always, I always correct them and say I have workshops. And people come here. We, uh, up until the pandemic, people were here in my studio you know, we meet on Thursday nights, we gather, we play music, and then we paint. We bring our friends in, we set up flowers, we talk, we have an exchange, um, and we paint, and we support each other in those changes because, you know, as a... I don't, I don't really want to be a teacher. You know, I want to be more of a somebody on your journey, you know, somebody that, that... Somebody who inspires you? Yeah, I mean, definitely. mentor is such a great word, right? Yeah. That's really what you mean. You know, when you have really good students and you inspire them and you're all kind of there, um, basically, you know, it's kind of like they throw the gauntlet down. You know, you're not just painting a subject. You're not just painting an object. You're trying to look past that and you're trying to pull out of the sitting a connection. And your students or your crew, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to say students. I mean, yeah, some people come to me and they start painting with me. They've never painted before. But it doesn't take much before they just become part of the crew. You know, it isn't just me teaching them, it's an exchange. So I'm turning you into a redhead, I don't know if you realize that. <laughs> I have no idea what's going on. Well, it's just because I'm talking so much, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, well, I'm having a great time. <laughs> okay. so. For me, um, I began to realize that I was achieving what I had wanted to achieve, and it was in the work more than anything else, more than what anybody else said. It had more to do with um, whether or not I could see it in the work. 
You have to get to a point where you feel like that the work has the ability to communicate uh, something meaningful. You know who Joseph Campbell is? Mm -hmm. When he talks about art, he says there's three forms of art, right? There's art that takes a lot of time, it's labor intensive, it's made out of gold or silver or something really precious, right? And then there's art that's pretty, looks good on your wall, makes your couch look good, makes your room look good, makes you feel good, maybe, you know, it's pretty. And then there's art that when you see it, it brings to light something in yourself or something in the person that you're painting that gives you an epiphany about who you are and who that person is or where you are or the value of that relationship. It hums. It talks to you. It says, come back, take another look. It haunts you. That's the kind of art that is meaningful to me. I, I'm um, kind of retired, but I have a very focused idea of what I want to contribute as an artist now. I'm strongly interested in making a difference with the plastics. Mm -hmm. I want to contribute to the positive aspect of regeneration for the next generation. You know, I don't want to think of only just myself. So I uh, was awarded the um, East Side Initiative. I was given a $10,000 award to initiate a toy project. And I call it Creating Cultural Currency. And that toy project, what we want to do is marry it with STEAM. Mm -hmm. Science, technology, engineering, art, and math. Mm -hmm. Right now, if you go to Target or Toys R Us or any of these places, you're going to find that I would say 85 to 95 percent of the toys are made out of plastic, mm -hmm. fossil fuel mm -hmm. plastic. Mm -hmm. So the idea is to get that out of the environment. These are called guidos. Now, Puerto Ricans and Caribbean music, it's often used. Mm -hmm. um, they, there's a striker. I don't know if I have a striker here. You can use anything as a striker, but it's a percussion I instrument. It's made out of bamboo. Bamboo is renewable. Uh -huh. But if you look on the internet and you're trying to buy one, they're made out of fossil fuel plastics. Right. And there isn't any reason for that. So that's one of the things we do. We get them to etch and burn into the bamboo. But the idea is to create a shift so that we can do that. The truth is I have so many little projects that as much as I like to talk about myself, and, and I can, I can talk forever, but the thing is that what we have to do is start utilizing this time and energy to st start solving the biggest problems yeah, we have right, right now. Right. Climate change. Climate change, change yeah. Uh -huh. Extinction yeah. of a lot of animals and yeah. plant life. Yeah. And um, my husband is... Uh, landscape architect. He taught at UCLA. So I've been thoroughly indoctrinated because I'm not just interested in sustainability, I'm interested in regeneration. Mm -hmm. Because sustaining ourselves right now where we are isn't going to be enough. Painting a portrait is kind of like getting on a uh, roller coaster. You take chances and you don't always know. Look, to get a really good piece of art, to get a really good piece of work, means that you're always setting yourself up to take mm -hmm. a risk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What does risk mean? It means that you also risk failing. Mm -hmm. And so, um, if you're not risking failure, you're not risking. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of the thing that you know, you can't, you know, I can't promise you that this is going to be the best portrait. <laughs> it could be, mm -hmm. you know, it could be a failure. Mm -hmm. But if I'm, if I don't risk failing it, then I'm 
not going to risk succeeding in the sense that we can really succeed at um, doing something really special beyond what we've done. You have to go, you have to up the ante every single time. That's just the nature of the beast. It almost has to be called from outside of me because it means that I've been able to connect and communicate with people in a way that I didn't get, I didn't see before. Because it's not a one-sided, it's not one-sided. You have an audience, whether or not you recognize them or you don't, mm -hmm. you have an audience. Mm -hmm. That audience may not have been born, mm -hmm. You know, maybe it's somebody in the future who gets you, mm -hmm. who gets where you're going and what you're doing. But, you know, it's got to be a communication with another soul. Mm -hmm. Painting, singing, writing, whatever your media is, is communicating with another person. It's communicating love or happiness or something. It's communicating something. And if there isn't anybody to hear it, you know, it's like that whole thing about the tree falling and yeah. nobody yeah. there to hear it fall. Yeah. You know, it's like, did it fall? Yeah. You have to be able to, to go through some of the, the ugly stuff to get to the good stuff. You know, people think, oh, I took up a brush and it was a work of art from the moment I touched the canvas. And, People are born with talent and, you know, uh, you're, you're born that way. And, you know, I think that's such an overrated. Mm -hmm. um, the prodigy. Uh, yeah, like sort it, of. it's an overrated concept yeah. because, yeah. to be honest, uh, I believe I worked and earned my skill. It's not just because, you know, um, I had you know, I know, or I can see, and I had great hand co uh, eye coordination. I mean, you weren't b born walking. Right. You weren't born talking or singing. You learned those activities. Right. And it's the same with pain. You have to give yourself enough time to, to, to say, hey, you know, I, I, I think I got it now. What made you start doing portraits? You know, uh, the very first portrait I ever did, I think I was eight or nine years old. <laughs> so I don't know what was in my head at the time, but I, I liked looking at a person. I liked, this sounds really weird, but um, I would sort of project myself Mm -hmm. into what that person felt like mm -hmm. and I didn't know it at the time but I would have to say that um, I guess it's a form of compassion mm -hmm. you know like how, what does that person feel like you know to have empathy for another person is about having the idea that you, you know how they feel whoever they are you know, and that, that's just my nature. I think that's just who I am.